All right, can I go? Yes. All right, hello everyone. Um, my name is Gidi Greenstein and I'm the founder and uh, president of Reut. Um, and I'm very, very proud of our team today, Iran and, all, and the rest of the team in general and uh, in general for the work, but also for the performance today. And I'm here to welcome and moderate the closing panel discussion about our issue, which is the view, uh, which deals with the view from Israel. Um, two weeks ago, I participated in a Socrates seminar of the Aspen Institute on critical race theory. I felt that in order to understand current American politics and its potential implications for the Jewish community and Israel, one had to understand that theory and its implications. We spent three days reading texts and discussing them. And I have to say, I learned a lot and very surprising uh, conclusions. I I'd like to share a couple. Some of my conclusions actually reinforce what Batya Unger Sargon's opening remarks, the key point of her opening remarks, which in a nutshell, um, critical race theory assumes that the mechanisms of racism and discrimination were institutionalized as of the 1970s into American society, following paradoxically the successes of the civil rights movement in the late 1960s. And this is manifested in voting laws in America, in education, access to education, employment policies, and of course, the practices of criminal justice. In this sense, critical race theory is an American manifestation of a global and universal phenomena whereby groups who are in power institutionalize their privileges. Indeed, such an urgent need for structural reform for example, in criminal uh, relating to criminal justice or access to higher education has been acknowledged across American society. But in another sense, I do share the sense of agency, urgency that underlies the conference today. Because critical race theory is fundamentally, I found it to be fundamentally pessimistic about American society, holding that there has been and will continue to be a permanent struggle between whites and blacks. And because of this fundamental outlook, critical race theory has an inherent interest in expanding the group of who's white and in expanding the group of the oppressed who are black in order to prove its point about the ongoing and inevitable conflict. This interest is particularly acute because American society is becoming blended. A person can be African-American and privileged. A person can be white and structurally marginalized or a Jew of color, as we've just heard in one of the breakout sessions. So for sure, the number of whites who are direct descendants of the Mayflower or the number of African-Americans who are direct descendants of slaves is, de is rapidly decreasing. Now, the Jewish community and its support of, for Israel are at the crosshairs of that interest to enhance the sense of conflict in American society. These ideas are spreading, and the whitening of American Jewry, as David Suiza so eloquently described, but also so many, did so many others, is a powerful trend that denies our own right to self-determination in the United States. In this sense, erasive anti-Semitism is a real concern. Now, because 80% of world Jews are in the US and Israel, this challenge is of a major concern to the entire Jewish people, and we need to pay close attention. The good news, as was mentioned earlier, is we're not alone in, this, in being subjected to these dynamics. In the same boats, we have Latinos who made it in America, Asian Americans, and others. And against this backdrop, here are a few observations about Israel in this context. First, Israeli leaders, I feel, don't fully understand this challenge to be uh, as a national security challenge to Israel, which is then addressed with a comprehensive response. It is not just about PR or repairing the political relations with the Democratic Party or being a bipartisan issue in America, but it is about a comprehensive, it requires a comprehensive outlook and approach with, from Israel addressed at the entire American society. Second is that there is a surprising synergy 
between the legacy of Israel's prominence in Africa in the late 1970s and early 1980s and the logic and the field of community relations today, which was also discussed here. In Africa, our presence and our leadership following the severing of the relationships in 1973 was based on the fact that significant um, formative personal professional experiences uh, of African leaders were given, were, uh, were taken through the relationship with Israelis. So these personal relationships were fundamental to the stature of Israel in Africa. And that insight on the importance of personal relationships across communities is also, it's fundamentally, is crucially important for Israel's uh, standing in the United States. In other words, community relations in the US is of profound strategic interest for Israel. Now, with these observations, I want to kick off the discussion today and to begin by introducing our speakers. Ambassador Asaf Zamil has been the Consul General of Israel in New York since October, 2021, uh, representing Israel to the great states of New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Delaware. He served as Minister of Tourism after serving as Deputy Mayor of Tel Aviv for 10, uh, for 10 years, holding the education portfolio and serving as acting mayor. This is Asaf. Brigadier General Reserves Sima Vaknin Gil is former intelligence officer in the Israeli Air Force, the chief, former, former chief censor of the state of Israel. Um, actually, Sima, I think that this role is, <laughs> is different than it sounds to American ears. Um, and Director General of the Ministry of Strategic Affairs and Public Diplomacy. Sima is the co-founder of Strategic Impact and a founding member of CAM, I believe it's pronounced uh, C-A-M, I believe it's pronounced CAM, which is Combat Anti the Combat Anti-Semitism Movement. She's also a senior advisor to different organizations which are dealing with anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial, like the ISGAP, which is a Cambridge-based research institute fighting contemporary anti-Semitism in academia, and also of the of the Network Contagation Research Institute based in Rutgers University that deals with online disinformation and extremism. And our third panelist is Avital Leibovich, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel uh, in the IDF, former reserve, of course. She's now the director of AJC Jerusalem and her distinguished careers spans over 20 years in a wide range of senior media and public relations positions within uh, the IDF. That's obviously prior to joining the AJC. Now, each speaker will have six minutes to present opening remarks. Then we will collect questions and every speaker, each and every one of you, will have a second and perhaps even a third round. So why don't we start with Asaf, continue with Sima, and then go to Avital. Please. Asaf. Thank you, PD. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, it's my first Reut uh, event, and I'm very uh, excited uh, to have the opportunity to speak here. I'm sorry for the technical problem, which doesn't allow you to see me better. I promise you, I wore my best suit uh, for all of you today. Um, anyhow, I've been here, uh, as Gidi said, a bit uh, less, a bit over uh, five months. Uh, for me, it's the beginning of my tenure still. And uh, I spent the beginning of my time, oh, just before that, the six minutes, Gidi, as a former politician, I don't know how to time that. I just have to stop. I don't I'll give you. Time. I'll give you a heads up when uh, five minutes are over. Thank you very much. I appreciate. I appreciate it dearly. So I started uh, learning. And we'll start counting now. Okay. I started learning the challenges uh, the Israeli-American relationship has uh, moving over here, and I think that the uh, subject of our conversation today is one of the two biggest challenges. Uh, we are uh, future to face in, in, in time, uh, threatening the uh, bilateral support in Israel, threatening bipartisanship that we've always enjoyed, threatening uh, full Jewish support of American Jews of the state of Israel. And uh, I will elaborate a bit, but it really is to one point that Gidi said, something that the I feel not enough people in, in Israel understand um, how important it is, what a big problem um, 
it is. The soft of the matter is for what Gidi said, he uh, dealt with one approach, which is the American uh, Jewry being regarded as a white group. Uh, for me, it is the turning uh, Israel from a progressive idea to a anti-progressive idea. Uh, from an idea that progressives are for to an idea that progressives are against. And in doing that, uh, they, they succeeded while detaching anti-Israel sentiments, anti-Zionist sentiments from anti-Semitism in a way that I believe is very dangerous. Saying that today uh, uh, being progressive is pro-equality and, uh, and not hating anyone on the uh, basis of his religion, but actually allowing that to happen in the back door, very smart narrative saying we have no problem with Jews as a group, we have a problem with their pro-Israel sentiment or with their connection to Israel or, and therefore with Israel's uh, right to self-determination and right to exist. This is something that didn't exist on the far right, but now exists on the far left uh, in the progressive uh, conversations. If you go back uh, far enough, Israel was a uh, progressive idea. It was a progressive idea that had the misfortune uh, of succeeding and in an era that uh, only looks at, uh, at the weak, is now regarded as a strong uh, oppressor and everything that goes with it. So today, this issue that used to be regarded as progressive is now white people oppressing brown people on the other side of the sea. And the white people in the United States that support the white people suppressing, oppressing the brown people is linked to the uh, black and white um, BLM issue in the United States. Um, that creates, in an era of extreme polarization politically, where everything is defined by what the other side thinks the opposite of, situates, situates us in a problematic area in the Progressive Democratic Party. Um, I know we're going to have time to talk about this in the, uh, in the, late, in, in the later part of this um, meeting, but I do want to say two more specific things about this. The first, and I think we need to address this, is there are a large and growing number of Jews that relate to this an analogy. You will find uh, organizations made up or called Jewish organizations that um, will back the idea that Jews are part of the white group that is uh, uh, su superior. So it's also affecting that. The second thing is. Stop just one minute, please. Sure, uh, it's perfect. The second thing is. I do see this as something changeable. And it's not just changeable on our side, it's changeable because there is something with the way the progressive politics in the United States are playing out that is making the job advocating against this idea easier. I'll give one example <laughs> that's right this week is the statement issued by the DSA yesterday um, talking about NATO's. Uh, overdominance in America's overdominance in NATO when they uh, w w uh, issued a statement against against Russia and against the war, they also spoke against the United States' involvement in NATO, NATO's involvement in the area, and for more people than others, it looked extremely radical to the point it doesn't make sense. Another example is that the group dictating that uh, Jews are part of the white group, and Israel is a white oppressing country. I've started criticizing everyone going to Israel, no matter in what aspect. And one example I want to give to you is that Congressman Jamal Bauman last month went to Israel, <laughs> and uh, he went on a J, J Street trip, visited Ramallah, I think, as well. After he came back, the progressive group in the United States, there were groups inside it that called to expel him. From the group just for going to Israel. And what that did 
is create a backlash, which I think should be the basis for this conversation, which is how to create the stream, which is both progressive and Zionist. How to re recreate or re uh, re enter or um, re establish the narrative which puts these two or allows these two ideas to be together? I think it's very, very important to give that outlet to people. So that's it. Stop, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We'll uh, circle back to you in a few minutes. Uh, Sima, please go ahead. I'm going to be a little bit stricter with you about the six minutes, okay? So, uh, because you know, I apologize. Me. <laughs> okay, so in six minutes and after a whole conference that deals with this issue, I would try to address the questions from a bird's view and maybe try to connect the dots and offer two observations of my own for the discussion. Uh, I'm interested in the question, how come Israel reached the point that we are in when it comes to public discourse about Israel? How is it that we are the only democratic country that there is a question regarding its right to exist? and its legitimacy to exist as the homeland for Jewish people. How is it the Israel brand when we have so many good things going for us? How come when you look online and elsewhere, the brand is mostly connected to negative uh, concepts? How is it that someone from external to the Jewish people is actually asking who we are? And there is questions whether we are religion or a race or a people or a nationality and how they have the audacity to tell us who we are, especially when it comes to Zionism. And what's between all that and anti-Semitism? So when I try to look at all these questions and try to see what is the connecting line between all of them, which is very hard to do in six minutes, I would just want to say a few things. First of all, this panel and, and actually the whole conference is dealing with some elements of the public discourse. And of course, it's dealing with the extremist uh, side. Uh, and might be a better balance when you look uh, in a broader view. But I have to say that if people think that the situation is good or not bad enough, they are wrong. And if I would have to use a term for my former uh, life as an intelligence person, I would like to offer us, the Jewish people and Israel, the term strategic alert. I think the last two years have provided us a strategic alert. There have been strategic shift not just in discourse, but actually we are trying, we are seeing some elements which are becoming prevalent, not just in public discourse, but actually in politics also. And we have reached a point of no return. In the Israeli Air Force, point of no return is when the airplane has to go forward, it can't go backwards. And I think this is exactly where the Jewish people today and Israel is. So when we try to look at the objective situation today, mainly in Europe and the United States, it's not encouraging at all. We have in many, far too many and far too many important uh, audiences, we have a very negative discourse about uh, Israel in academia, in culture, in sport, in media, in politics. The fact that it is legitimate to even ask the questions whether Israel has the right to exist is something that was not uh, present before. And what's more important is that you know that something is broken when from your own people, people are asking this question, which is amazing to me. When it comes to Israel, uh, in the NCRI Network Contagion Research Institute in Rutgers, when we do topic networks analysis, we see that Israel is mainly connected, mainly not just on social media, by the way, in the internet as a whole, and not just in hubs, as public discourse as a whole online, we see that Israel is connected mainly to negative concepts. So we are all knowing colonialism, apartheid, Nazism, white privilege, oppressors, uh, foreigners, also genocide, ethnic cleansing. But I have to tell you something that we found out very um, lately, which for me, it was amazing. When someone wants to push his agenda and he wants to reach new target audience, they use Israel as apartheid states because they know that through this concept, they would gain more uh, reach, which is amazing. It just so show how Israel has become something that they can push. The general feeling among those who are fighting anti-Semitism, and I'm involved with more than 10 groups, is that we are on the defensive and we are reactive. We've lost the momentum. The other side has a very catchy and easy message. They know how to work like a swarm. It's guided by the inner logic that everybody is around it. They work simultaneously. They work consistently, they work at the right places. And I have to tell that they are doing a good job and we are in a war of attrition and sometimes we lost the momentum. Uh, 
And when it comes to the rise in anti-Semitism, people feel that something has changed in the order that the last decade provided us and we felt very comfortable with. But then when someone is taking you out of your comfort zone, you're bound to make a mistake. And we are being attacked from all around. We have a radical Islam and political Islam. We have a right-wingers and we have left, extremists left. So all in all, Jews are feeling, Jews and Israelis are feeling on the defensive. If I would like to ask myself and answer something. Tima, just one minute, please. Just one minute. Why is it that everything is happening? I would like to offer a, a second a metaphor to be used. I would like to say that the delegitimization campaign is the software to everything else, which is the hardware. So the software, I don't have to explain the legitimization campaign here, but under this guise, delegitimization of Israel, which is penetrating everything and connected to social, ideological, political, economical processes. I'm not gonna talk about it. I'm just gonna say the bottom line. When, because of that, the whole conversation is about race, color, and social status, Jews and Israelis are on the wrong side of the equation. Or uh, add to that uh, external uh, crises like the corona, social unrest, and everything else. Add to that technology. And by the way, we have to say to ourselves as Israelis, we've made some mistakes and we have to understand that we are partly responsible for some of the things. So you would take the hardware and the software, combine it together, and this is what we got. Dima, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Also for doing it in six minutes. And now, Vital, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and I'd like to congratulate you all on an impressive conference, and I think it's a very important topic. With your permission, I'll share with you my insights on the progressive Jews in America. And I'd like to begin with a short story. A few years ago, I visited Westchester, and I had the opportunity to speak in a... John, I think that there is uh, something with your mic. The sound is really... Uh, um... Now, is it better? I think it's a little bit better, please. Okay. I had the opportunity to speak to a room full of people uh, in Westchester a few years ago. And, um, and, and one of the people got up, it was a room full of Jews. Many of them were progressive Jews. And one of the people got up and uh, I asked, and, and he asked me and actually told me that what kept him up at night were the fires in California. And I explained to him that what keeps me up at night is that my daughter will come home safely from her military service somewhere in the border with Syria. So that's where my story begins. When I'm looking at the characteristics of the progressive Jews in America, I, from an Israeli perspective, of course, because this is what we're talking about, I can talk about a few uh, issues here, a few characteristics here. For example, um, there is some percentage of the progressive Jews which are still affiliated with some Jewish institutions, some synagogues or some connection to a summer camp, Sunday school, whatever. There are leading values like human rights, women, minorities, tikkun olam, uh, which I'm not a big fan of, of that uh, term, uh, separation between state and religion, uh, political affiliation is mainly Democrats, uh, often critical of Israelis' policies. Uh, according to polls that we have done in AJC, uh, maximum 50% have visited, of Jews in America at all, have visited Israel at least once. A lot of ignorance from the perspective of not reading material regarding Israel. Areas regarding areas of friction between Israelis and, and Jews in America, especially progressive Jews, is the government, the Israeli government's policies. And I can give a few examples. When we discuss the issue of opening the American embassy in Jerusalem, and I remind our viewers that we were talking about Western Jerusalem, in other words, not an area in conflict, then 50% of Jews in America actually oppose this move. And uh, if I'm going back to the JCPOA in 2015, in Israel, it was almost a consensus across the political map regarding the uh, lacking of the agreement, regarding of the, uh, uh, of the implications, the negative implications for Israel in the agreement, almost 90%, 89% of the Israeli public so, uh, was against the agreement. And, and in America, we saw something like uh, uh, 
50% who supported the agreement. I'm talking, of course, about the Jewish part. And of course, uh, the, I'm talking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which uh, there is um, um, a big tendency to, to put all blame on Israel, being the Goliath, the strongest one, and so on. Sheikh Jarrah is another point of friction. Um, sadly, you know, the Israeli court uh, ordered and, 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 and said uh, specifically that there are Jewish ownerships on uh, specific housing in this neighborhood, but this is, was not accepted. I mean, the court, the legislation authority was not accepted by uh, some streams in the, among the progressives. And of course, we have the religion issue of uh, friction, which is conversion, portal, and so on. From the Israeli side, and I think this is important, the general public in Israel cannot differentiate between the streams. They have no idea what are uh, reconstructionists, what are the differences between conservatives and reforms, uh, and therefore they are also ignorant uh, uh, understanding the situation. Uh, and if I'm taking, if I'm dividing for a minute the Israelis to two generations, the older generations and the younger generations, so the older generations uh, uh, in Israel, when they speak about Jews in diaspora, their almost automatic uh, response is, well, you know, they should make aliyah and come to Israel and live here. Where the young generation uh, actually, uh, you know, think that they can live wherever they want, but would like them to keep some sort of uh, a connection. But here is a big but. On the list of the priorities on both sides of the border, we the Jewish day One more minute, okay? So... Okay, I'm not home. sure, okay, but okay. Bring, <laughs> no, try, try to bring it best. home. I'll try, I'll try to do my best. Uh, on the list of the priorities, Israelis are not on the high priorities of American Jews in the progressive streams and vice versa. Um, but here is the problem. I heard one of the sessions, one of the speakers said, you can be also pro-Palestinian, pro-Israeli. That is not the issue whatsoever. The question is, how can you, as you define yourself as a pro-Israeli organization, a person or, uh, uh, affiliated with Israel, then what do you do in times of crisis? For example, I'm holding a press release by one that was released in May there, uh, by one of the biggest um, uh, progressive movements in America, basically making an equation uh, between Israel and Hamas. We also urge Israel, and I'm, I'm quoting, we also urge Israel to protect the freedom of worship of Muslims in the holy month of Ramadan and to use all possible restraints. Well, in other words, this comparison is not logic, it's irrelevant, and it's also depicting Israel as, as an entity who does not uh, give a freedom of uh, expression and religion. But I do want to say that there are opportunities. It has to be the opportunities, very short. I'll be very short. The opportunities are as follows. Number one, we have the new political arena uh, here in, the, in Israel and, and also in the US. So there are uh, possibilities to uh, uh, speak about the new legislations, for example, that we have in Israel, uh, dealing with LGBT communities, environment, and other issues. Abraham Accords, I don't think that the Jewish progressives in America understand the major historic shifts that the Abraham Accord have uh, uh, led this region and, and still the, the impact is still live and kicking. And also, and finally, this is my last words, Gidi, uh, the young generation of Jews needs to understand that Israel needs to do a better job explaining. The young generation needs to understand what can Israel bring to them. It's not religion, it's not politics, but the impact. Israel has moved from a startup nation to an impact nation. And every young person all over the world wants to have a bite of this impact. So on the high tech, fintech, uh, uh, meditech and others, we can definitely do uh, a better job to, uh, uh, to influence them. So there are opportunities and uh, this country needs to uh, invest in these opportunities. And thank you for the opportunity to speak. So first of all, thank you very much. Thank you, Sima. Thank you, Asaf. Um, while you were talking, I was looking at the Q&A. Either we shocked and awed them, or um, <laughs> the 55 people here have checked out. But there are no questions. So I will give one question, and all of you could have a closing 
uh, statement. We'll start with Avital, Sima, and Asaf. You'll really close the event. We do have a very hard stop at uh, 55, so in seven minutes. So I believe, uh, as I said at the beginning, that uh, there is no awareness in Israel enough of the kind of trends and the, the implications that are in, uh, the implications of the trends that are emerging in American politics and society for Israeli national security. I believe Asaf also spoke about this, but also that this is changeable. And you, Sima, you also spoke about strategic alert. And Avital, you spoke about these very powerful trends. So really the question, and to bring this session together and to bring the whole conference together is, what could be done? What is the top one, two, or three steps that each and every one of you will say we need to do? Please, one minute and 30 seconds each. Avital, you go first, Sima second, and Asaf, you'll close. Okay, so first of all, education on both sides of the border. As I mentioned before, Israelis don't have the, the knowledge to understand what is American Jews. Uh, uh, the same here and the same uh, in America. They need to understand what Israel is all about. This is not uh, 70 years ago. We are in a totally different place making impact on the world. Number two, shockingly, many of the American Jews have never met an Israeli. And if they do meet an Israeli, it's maybe a shalom of the Sikhut, which is very, very positive. But we need to create uh, additional engagements between our two communities. And third, from an Israeli perspective, in my humble opinion, the Jewish diaspora in America should be an integral part of Israel's national security concept. And we need this government to move forward and actually give practicality to the sentence, this uh, thing that I'm saying, uh, and I think we'll be able to, to work on this with this grand government. Excellent, Avital, thank you very much, and thank you for your great work. I know all the work as the AGC is doing in Israel and around the world and in the Gulf, it's phenomenal. Thank you, Sima, you're next. Sima, you gotta unmute yourself. Yeah, I think we should, uh understand that the penetration of anti-Israel, anti-Zionism discourse uh, to the mainstream and the changing of the mindset eventually would become a national security issue to the Jewish people. It's not there yet, but looking forward and seeing that the uh, young people of today are becoming the leaders of tomorrow and they are being brainwashed in a very specific way. And we have seen some uh, examples like the Iron Dome issue or the uh, decision 2334, but I can definitely see an impact uh, on, uh, I don't know, um, United States uh, uh, relations with Middle East moderate countries, or a, we already see the nuclear issue and so on and so forth. So under this understanding, I think we should first acknowledge the threat, understand it, internalize it, and then come up with a very cold strategic how to deal with it. I have to tell you that from my understanding with a lot of conversation with mainly Americans and Europeans, we haven't even gone through the first phase of acknowledging the problem. I, I agree with you, totally personal. That's my personal opinion. Thank you very much. Great working with you in the past and I hope we'll do it in the future. And now Asaf, floor is yours to bring it home. First of all, thank you. <clears throat> um, I don't think the solution to this uh, big problem will come from, from Israel. And I'm not sure there's a way to really make people in Israel understand the situation here, as long as it's static and doesn't get worse. <clears throat> in a way, it's natural. People have their own problems and they deal with local issues and the politics are aligned. Someone said once Israel doesn't have a foreign policy, just a domestic, for, uh, just a domestic policy. I think the issue of the, uh, of, I'll call it the progressive support in Israel, uh, in Zionism, is something that needs to be solved here in the United States through the younger generation. Primarily the Jew, young, younger Jewish generation, but not just the younger Jewish democratic generation. Again, I, I'll, I'll say to something I said, I've said already, reinventing the way we speak about Israel and making it relevant and current to 2022 in a language that is adaptable inside uh, conversations that are very short, binary, uh, black and white, good and bad, uh, in places where people are really listening. Because if we don't do it through here, 
to this younger generation, which is our problem, won't be fixed anywhere else. Staff, thank you very much. And uh, really, it's a great pleasure to have you in New York. And we also met socially. It's fantastic. Um, so I want to thank you, all of you, Avital, uh, Sima, and Asaf. Uh, I want to thank everybody on the line. I see that there are dozens of people watching us uh, right now. Um, and hand it over to Iran. Iran and his team have worked for weeks, months, on bringing this whole thing together. Dozens of speakers, multiple forums, top quality uh, discussion, super relevant. And uh, I'm very proud to be uh, part of your team, Iran. So uh, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Gidi. First of all, thank you all for virtually attending the conference uh, and deep gratitude for all the speakers. So many, so I will not name them. Um, all the recordings are already available, available sorry, at the Zoom events platform that we used uh, and we uploaded to our Facebook and web page very soon. I want to express my deepest gratitude to the Lebitsky Family Foundation and to another donor who prefers to stay anonymous for supporting this event uh, and, and allow this to, and, and, and this event and another in-person event that took place in New York a few months ago. I would like to thank Denise the friend Lahat, I hope I pronounced the name right, the founder of Life for You, uh, for leading the complex technological navigation with endless patience and professionality and all our team. Um, I want uh, uh, Yoni and uh, Nisim. I want to thank my mentor and friends, the founder of Root and Tom and Tikunola makers, Giddy Greenstein, for your guidance, trust, and good advisors. I think that everyone should uh, be entitled to a mentor like Giddy. I want to thank Matan Sandler, Ilad Rechler, uh, for volunteering and assisting us in the leading in leading the breakout sessions. Refuashlema to Zora Mandel, who was supposed to do that, uh, but got uh, sick. Uh, it would have been an impossible mission to do this event without my team of supermen and superwomen. Uh, my team has been leading this event, both logistically and content-wise. Some of my team members spoke at the conference, others led the breakout sessions. Thank you so much, Barak Sela, Abed, Avital, and Adi. Uh, we will be in touch uh, in regard to the next steps very soon. Come and join us uh, to the virtual cocktail party. 